Hello, Alex here, and in this second video on my series on mastering Harman Phoenix 200, I want to talk about how you can get the best possible results when using the E6 color reversal process to make slides. Let's get into it. For any of you who haven't seen my original video on pushing and cross-processing Phoenix, I took a roll and developed it in the E6 process after shooting it at 200, the box speed, assuming it would be working like Kodak Aero Color, which it definitely doesn't, and with an 81B warming filter for various color correction reasons I won't break down in too much detail here. The results weren't great, but I learned a hell of a lot from just that first test roll. The slides were very dark, and rating the film at 200 was just not enough light, so a lot more exposure would be needed to get good slides. The slides were very, very blue, even with the 81B filter, and they could be somewhat corrected in post, but it still wasn't a great look, and if you're personally into projecting your slides, these were not really projection worthy in any way whatsoever. Lastly, the grain was extremely fine, far finer than you would get with normal C41 negatives from Phoenix. At the time, I made an offhand comment about the idea that maybe Phoenix could actually be a tungsten balanced slide film that we were just cross processing in C41, and that is definitely not the case. If you aren't convinced by the end of this video, you will definitely be convinced by the end of this project and understand at a chemical level why I was mistaken. I've already given my full project introduction before in the C41 video, so I'm not going to go through it all again, but in this video, I have two questions I want to answer. Why is the grain so fine when you cross-process in E6 compared to the C41 process? And what does it take in terms of filtration and exposure to get good slides? Actually, no, there are two things that I need to talk about before we get into it briefly. The first is that Harman confirmed that the base used for Phoenix is an acetate base, not polyester, which is why it doesn't suffer from light piping, which is good news, but it also explains something that's a bit tricky with this project. When I'm judging the exposure of the slides to tell you EI whatever is a good result, or I'll give you a range more realistically, I, I can't judge this based on the exposure of the highlights, only the midtones and the shadows, because the base material isn't completely clear. This isn't a slide film, it's not meant to be reversal processed, so it just happens that the base has decent clarity. It's not as clear as the base used for like Fujifilm Provia, Adox CMS20 and other films, so the D-min of the slides is relatively high. So when you overexpose the slides more and more, you'll see that the highlight detail will start to clip before the slides go actually pure white, because there's a level of density adding, you know, color and density to the highlights. If you're unfamiliar with slide terminology, that may be a bit tricky, but just know that the slides aren't going to be as bright and vivid as a true slide film if you're projecting them, and if you're scanning them, you're going to need to set your white point. The other thing I want to say is that later in the video, I am combining multiple filters for some of these tests, and to calculate the filter factor, at least approximately, I just spot metered through the stacked filters off of the grey card in my test scene. This gives me a decent enough approximation, and it's going to be within about half a stop, but it's not going to be perfect because the spectral sensitivity of my light meter and Harman Phoenix aren't going to perfectly align. Towards the end of the video and the conclusion, I will just give you very explicit instructions in terms of filter factors that I've judged based on the slides, or like your meter readings if you're using an external meter. My original comparison I made between C41 and E6 comparing the grain turned out to not be so representative, and I'm apologizing essentially to everyone who took that as gospel. It turns out that that was actually a worst case scenario. This is the photo in question, the one that people were sharing around, comparing the grain, and I got the scaling wrong in my sleep deprived stupor when I was getting these videos ready for launch, so here's a reframed version that gives a slightly more representative idea of what's going on. To make a long story short so we can get into the actual meat of this video, I went through my original rolls with a fine toothed comb and did some very detailed comparisons and found out a few things that explain why this comparison was so dramatic. Though both the slides and the negatives do go grainy in the shadows, which is to be expected based on what I talked about in the previous video, the slides hold up a lot better in the shadows than the negatives do. Phoenix is also not just very green under fluorescent light, it's also actually slightly grainier under fluorescent light than under daylight. Here's a comparison of two different photos taken under daylight. It's still a big difference in terms of grain, but it's more representative of how the film actually behaves when cross-processed. In hindsight, it probably makes sense that I shouldn't have done the comparison test under artificial light, but I was strapped for time and that's just something I have to bear in mind for future if I have an opportunity like that again. 
For me to be able to properly explain why the grain is so fine in the E6 chemical process, I need you to understand how the E6 process works. There are multiple color layers in every color film, but we're gonna use the magenta forming layer as an example for simplicity. And if you're already familiar with how E6 works, just skip to this timestamp up here. After exposing the film and all that jazz that I spoke about in the previous video, the first developer step uses a black and white developer to make a black and white negative made up of metallic silver. The second step is a reversal step where the film is chemically re-exposed so that all the parts of the image that were not developed the first time can now be developed during the second development step. Next is the second developer or color developer or CD step where the CD reduces the silver ions in exactly the same way that I spoke about before but with a key difference. When the color developer reduces the silver ions, it itself becomes oxidized, and those two processes can't happen independently. There's always a reduction-oxidation coupling, or, or a pair, which is why this chemistry is called redox, for reduction oxidation. But you've probably never heard about oxidized developers before, at least outside of the context of, you know, storing your black and white developer and it going bad. That's because most black and white developers in their oxidized form are completely inert and immediately become irrelevant and we don't have to worry about them anymore. But in the case of color film, whether it's reversals or negatives, the oxidized color developer will react with the dye couplers and actually combine with them to form the final dyes. The developer in its oxidized form is actually part of the final dye molecule and that's why the dye couplers are called couplers because they couple to the developer. They are not just the dye themselves, that's why there's no color before development. And this is why you're able to get colors from the reversal process. When you first develop with the black and white developer, you make a negative and that oxidized black and white developer cannot do anything with the dye couplers, so you don't form any colors. Then when you develop with the second developer, you form colors in the you know, complementary parts of the image, the parts that weren't developed the first time around. If you imagine we're looking at the red ball that we've seen in the previous image, if you expose that, you're exposing the cyan forming red layer the most. You develop that in the, with the black and white developer first, which prevents the formation of cyan dye in the second developer step. So you would preferentially form yellow and magenta dye in that second step and yellow and magenta add together to make red, which is why your colors don't come out inverted after the reversal process. Then you use your bleach, fixer, stabilizer, maybe a photo flow and all that jazz like any other color process. But it's the first three steps that I need you to understand so that you actually get how this all works. With that out of the way, I have gone off the deep end and I want to know why and exactly why the grain is so fine when cross-processing in E6. I've cracked exactly why, I've narrowed it down by process of elimination and the answer is fairly anticlimactic. My first thought was that maybe since the color negatives have really coarse grain and the slides have really fine grain, the first development of any roll of Phoenix gives you coarse grain and then you're leaving the smaller grains in the emulsion behind, maybe the larger ones are developed preferentially, and those smaller ones are developed in the color developer step of the E6 process, which will give you a fine grain slide. So I took a test strip, used the black and white first developer from the E6 kit to develop it to make a black and white negative. Compared to a C41 negative, the grain is actually ridiculously fine and that's immediately obvious. So Phoenix just isn't grainy in any old developer. It can give quite fine grain depending on how you develop it. So the idea that the first developer is developing the large grains away and leaving the small grains behind for the second developer, that's not right. C41 development uses a developer called Color Developing Agent 4 or just CD4 and the ECN2 and E6 processes use CD3 as their developer. The chemical difference between CD3 and CD4 is actually slightly greater than the difference between rhodonol and hydroquinone, so it's entirely possible that they could yield slightly different grain structures. I developed the test strip in the E6 color developer to make a negative and then bleached and fixed it just like you would if you were doing a C41 chemical process but using CD3 as the color developer. Aside from that orange tone that we will eventually be coming back to, the grain is so, so much worse than in the C41 negatives. I was looking at the test strip and trying to figure out why it's so dense and like incredibly fogged looking and yeah, it's because it's fogged. The E6 kit from Bellini doesn't have a wash step between the reversal bath and the color developer. So because this wasn't the first roll that I developed in that kit, there was some reversal bath contamination in the color developer. In this case, it meant that I had to go and buy another E6 kit and do it again with fresh uncontaminated CD3 developer. And now it's actually somehow even worse because I guess without the reversal bath fogging the shadows and adding density to them, the contrast is just off the charts and the grain is still ridiculous as well. 
This is essentially the same general idea as pre-flashing paper in the darkroom to tame your contrast. Anyway, there has to be something else going on here because both this slide and this negative use CD3 as their color developer and the difference in grain is honestly stupid. So having seen that, it has to be something to do with the fact that there are two development steps with the reversal bath in between because something has to be figuratively restraining the CD3 from going absolutely hog wild with the grain because we see that if you just let it do its own thing, it does go hog wild with the grain. The next thing I tried was to see whether or not there was an impact on the fineness or of the fineness of the grain of the original negative on the fineness of grain in the slide after reversal. So I used some of the clean, uncontaminated color developer as the first developer for a really crappy E6 reversal process. So I used the color developer, reversal, color developer again, and then bleach fix, etc. I know these slides look like absolute crap, but that's because the color developer isn't right for the first development step of making a slide and I deliberately ran the first dev step for quite a short time just to make sure I wasn't overdeveloping, but ignore all that. It is hard to make out, but if I brighten it up quite a bit, you can see that the grain hasn't changed whatsoever. So the nature of the developer and the fineness of the grain that you get for the first development step have absolutely nothing to do with the grain in the final slides, which means it has to be something to do with the combination of the reversal bath and the color developer together. But we've already seen that the color developer on its own will give the most intense grain I have ever seen from Phoenix in my life. And I've seen a lot of Phoenix negatives at this point. So it has to be just by process of elimination, something to do with the reversal bath. I mentioned earlier that the reversal step is a chemical fogging process rather than just re-exposing to light like you might do with something like the Adox Scala kit. The chemical reversal has some advantages, especially for very large films. That's a whole thing for another day. At least in the case of the E6 kit from Bellini, the reversal bath is a solution of tin dichloride in some acid. Tin 2 ions in the tin dichloride are able to reduce silver plus ions to metallic silver atoms, just like you would with your normal developer. And basically, because we immerse the entirety of the film in that uh, reversal bath, we are basically peppering the entire emulsion with the latent image crystals absolutely everywhere through the entire way. This is why the rebate of a slide is black, because it does get re-exposed in this second step. And we only do this for a couple of minutes, so it doesn't actually start to grow those crystals like the developer would. And that will happen in the color, developing step, color development step that happens immediately afterwards. An important thing that I didn't mention here is that the color development step generating the color dyes with the CD3 is to completion. It is 100% absolutely completely done when it's done. There's no way to push slide film by over developing with the color developer. You can only do that by changing the time used for the first development step. So that means our maximum density for a slide is fixed by the amount of fuel in the film, the amount of silver and dye coupler that can be used to generate dyes. That sets your D-max. So in the case where we have a ridiculous number of latent image crystals after the reversal step, and we have a fixed maximum amount of density, which we are going to achieve by developing the color developer to completion, that means there's less fuel going around for each latent image crystal. So going back to what I was talking about in the first video, that means if each of those have less fuel, they cannot grow as large, and then each grain has to be smaller. So the end result is that the E6 grain for Harman Phoenix is only so fine because that's just how E6 works. It's nothing special to do with Phoenix or its chemical nature. It just so happens that the difference is quite large because Phoenix is such a grainy film in the C41 process. It's a bit anticlimactic, actually. I thought there would be some super secret thing. And honestly, I'm actually kind of glad that the CD3 developer on its own used to make negatives gave such ridiculously coarse grain because that really put the nail in the coffin that it's just the reversal process. That's all. Okay, Alex, yeah, the grain is fine. Yeah, we've known that since December, but how do we get good slides? I ordered a couple of filters, did some testing, ordered some more filters, did more testing, and I've gotten as close as I reasonably can to getting color accurate slides straight out of the tank with just filtration, at least using off the shelf filters. There's definitely room to go further than I have, but I'm trying to keep it accessible. And you know, if you're willing to make your own filters, you're firmly in the minority, even by my standards. My first test roll was just a shotgun approach. I bracketed in whole stops with a range of filters to narrow things down a bit, see what definitely didn't work. With no filters, the sweet spot looks like it's somewhere between 50 and 25. And in the photo at 25, you can see what I meant earlier about the highlights blowing out without the whites actually going to white. 
An 81B warming filter changes your white balance by about 300 Kelvin, warming the image just a touch. That's a smidge more than one click of the white balance slider in Lightroom, and it really didn't do a lot here. One of the things I wished I had for the original video was an 85B filter. This is essentially a white balance conversion filter that allows you to shoot tungsten balanced film under daylight. Tungsten balanced film is designed to be shot under tungsten lighting, shocker. And tungsten lighting is very warm and orange. So tungsten balanced film adds a lot of blue into the images to counter that. So an 85B adds orange to daylight, which is contrary to what you might think, a lot bluer than artificial tungsten lighting so that the uh, orange from the filter is countered by the blue of the film and you get like a normal color balance. A lot of people suggested that after I put out that first video, so I bought one from Tiffin and I tried that next. Here things actually look a lot better. It's still very aqua greenish, but the pink, orange, red and brown squares on the chart look so much better because the red channel is coming through so much more nicely. The next thing was stacking both the 81B and 85B filters together for a slightly stronger effect. The color cast is more green and less aqua now, and the table looks a lot better than just using the 85B alone. The only way to know you've gone far enough is to go too far and then backpedal. So I tried a straight up yellow filter and then stacked all three filters just for the fun of it. So the results do look pretty good, but they are still very green. And I wanted to see if I could get rid of that by adding another filter. Turns out green casts are a known and solved problem for underwater photography. So I was able to pick up a magenta filter to cancel out the green. Although Tiffin do make them, I wasn't gonna spend 100 plus euros on one. So I picked up a magenta filter from Mantona for use with a GoPro, and that was absolutely perfect. It saves me money and it's still decently representative because it's not some cheap Temu crap. When stacking the 85B and magenta filter together, the actual usable film speed drops quite a lot more because we're using a smaller and smaller band of the film's actual spectral sensitivity. Around EI12 seems like a good result. 16 could pass under high contrast scenes, and it's a bit easier to see after I set the white point. So to summarize this chapter, the grain mystery is completely solved. The fine grain from the E6 slides comes from the reversal step, which chemically peppers the, the emulsion with latent image crystals before the second development. Because the second development goes to completion, we generate a very high amount of density, and that means we need to generate a very dense negative in the first development step, so we have some actual clarity in the highlights, after the second development step. And this is why you need to overexpose the film quite a lot because the D max, the densest part of a well exposed negative is nowhere near as dense as the D max of the blacks of a completely re-exposed and redeveloped slide. This is why in general, you need to push and cross pro push and overexpose color negative film when you're cross processing to make slides to actually push through that density and actually clear your highlights up to a decent usable level. When it comes to using filters, the 85B color conversion filter is the absolute minimum. It takes out most of the blue and turns it into an aqua green color that overall just makes the slides look more like expired slide film, but you know, in a way that may or may not be appealing. I personally think it looks better than the blue look of the original slides because they don't even look that tungsteny in hindsight, they just look blue in a bad way. Using an 81B on top of the 85B does help a little bit, but adding the magenta filter is what makes the real difference. It takes out a ton more green without warming up the slides quite too much. Still, these slides aren't that great for projection. The D-min isn't very good because the base isn't super clear and the overall effort and film speed and overall color palette aren't going to be as good as obviously Provia and Ektachrome, but even cross-processing other films like Kodak Aero Color, and if you go with that film, you just need to use an 81B warming filter. You don't need to go through quite as much work as this. If you decide to shoot Phoenix with an 85B to make slides, rate the film at either 32 or 40, and you'll get decent results. It will take a lot of work in post to get decent colors, but you can do it. If you want to get the best possible result with off-the-shelf filters, just straight out of the tank, use the 85B and the magenta filter, shoot the film at either 12 or 16, and then compensate for your filters. Or if you're using an external meter, rate the film at, or set your meter to EI6. That's what I've been doing and it has worked quite well, though I have tried TTL metering and at least with that combination, it seems to be working quite well as well. The last thing I want to say about this is that you can actually color correct those 85B magenta slides a bit further if you want. And I really do actually quite like the look. It looks almost like a really fine grained retro chromish kind of look. And Shock horror, you know, guy with the YouTube channel and the next pan likes retro chrome, such an original idea, I know. But it, it is kind of a look and it's definitely not true to life or anything, but I think it's a surprisingly good performance all things considered, 
if you're willing to put up with a very low effective film speed coming down from 200 all the way to six. That's not gonna be for a lot of people, but if you want to shoot Phoenix to make slides, that's what it's gonna take. At least in the E6 process. Stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at chaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you liked this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.